are in listen-only mode. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to welcome you this morning to our benchmarking and reporting webinar uh, given to you by Tennessee HFMA. My name is Geis Smith, and uh, I'm a partner with an executive search firm, Stan and Chase International. I'll be your moderator this morning, and we'll be you'll also hear the voice of Brad Adams, a fellow HFMA member who is with uh, Vanderbilt Health System there. Uh, <clears throat> a couple things I'd like to cover with you just as we get started here is that we uh, have posted the slides on our website, and you can find the link in the GoToWebinar chat box there. Also, too, I want to remind you of a couple of other upcoming events that we have. Uh, the next webinar will be on July 8th, so mark that down, and it will feature Dave McCauley and discuss the five levels of communication. Uh, you can register for this webinar now by visiting the Tennessee HFMA website, uh, which would be tnhfma.org slash webinars. I want to also uh, go ahead and give you something a little further out there, remind you that uh, October 22nd and 24th of this year, uh, we'll be having our Fall Institute. And you can go to the uh, website there for uh, Tennessee HFMA and see the other details as we put registration up in the next couple of months. Uh, as far as uh, CPE uh, certificates and such this morning, a couple of things I want to make you aware of there. Uh, in order to obtain the CPE certificate, you must be connected to the webinar for at least 90% of the duration of the event this morning. Also, you must respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions that will be asked during the webinar. Uh, we're very fortunate this morning to have uh, Jackie Boswell with us. Uh, Jackie is employed by the State Volunteer Mutual Insurance Company uh, as a senior medical practice consultant. Her background includes over 25 years as a medical executive, and that would include both hospital and physician practice administration. She's a fellow in the American College of Medical Practice Executives and serves as a committee chair of the Man MGA Financial Management Society. Jackie's a trustee uh, of the board of directors at Three Rivers Hospital in Waverly, where she serves as the secretary of the board and a member of the finance committee. And without further ado, we want to bring to you Jackie Boswell. Take it away, Jackie. Good morning. Uh, well, I guess it's still morning. Um, so we're going to talk today about benchmarking, benchmarking and dashboard reporting. And um, Brad mentioned that, or Guys mentioned that I've been in healthcare a long time, and I used to work for Baptist Hospital. Well, I worked for Blue Cross for seven years, Baptist Hospital for seven years, and then went to the physician side and um, managed Nashville Medical Group, which is a large group uh, affiliated with Baptist. So. I know that some of you may be on the hospital side and um, starting to work with physicians more and more as we're seeing um, hospitals employ physicians and have different um, relationships with physicians such as professional services agreements and um, recruiting agreements. So we're going to talk about uh, benchmarking and uh, initially, and what is benchmarking? And um, benchmarking is basically the process of uh, measuring performance, key performance indicators, or KPIs, and those key performance indicators should be both internal and external, and these should be compared with national averages, and not just the median when you look at national averages or um, of, of you know all practices, but I like to advise physicians to compare themselves with better performers because that's where we all want to be. We all want to be in the category of a better performer, and better performers benchmark themselves, and then they automate the process of benchmarking. When I was managing National Medical Group, we would uh, I would get a stack of papers and reports about six inches high, and then we would take those uh, certain numbers from those reports and plug them into spreadsheets to develop uh, our reporting and our benchmarking. 
Well, that was about a three-day process. So as much as you can automate this process, uh, the better off you're going to be. So why benchmark? Well, benchmarking helps us answer um, how are we doing? Um, and not just how are we doing, but where do we want to go from here? And how do we get there? Um, and, and the value in benchmarking doesn't come just from comparing two numbers to each other, comparing how we're doing against some benchmark out there. But the true value of benchmarking comes from um, understanding where we are, understanding the true state of our, our practice or our facility. And it, you have to be very careful with, with benchmarking. And I tell practices and physicians that you want to benchmark, but you want to understand what you're benchmarking and be very careful with benchmarking. And um, typically, we don't hire and fire people based on where we are with, with benchmarks. But a benchmark just lets us know, you know how we're doing. And benchmarking can help us answer uh, physician questions and typically we get questions from physicians like are we collecting what we should collect or uh, what might be underlying in that question is why are my collections lower than my partner's collections uh, how many employees should we have uh, per physician and uh, importantly to understand per provider some practices have may have uh, many physician extenders, have several physician extenders. So you have to be careful when you're benchmarking if you're comparing per physician or per provider. And an underlying question there is physicians may be thinking, do we really need all these people? And um, they're asking that you, we often get the question, are my expenses too high? Or the underlying thought there is where can we cut costs? And so benchmarking, um, can help you not just say yes or no to these questions, but prove uh, that you are or are not, uh, that you do or do not have too many people, that your expenses are or are not too high. And I, I laugh and tell um, physicians, that they forget to a answer one question. There's a question missing here that many of you may be thinking in your head, um, uh, well, Physician, you're forgetting to ask one question, and that is physician productivity. The physician productivity is sometimes the hidden question um, that physicians don't ask. So it's, it's important not just to benchmark, but get the question right. Are you asking the right question? Because the question you ask determines the results you'll get. Um, so physician productivity is, is uh, one of those areas we want to benchmark as well and answer questions to. And um, I tell my physicians, one accurate measure is worth a thousand expert opinions. The physicians can ask all day long, but I tell practices, the numbers speak for themselves. If you can show the physician, if you can um, measure something instead of just answering a question yes or no, then sometimes it will halt the conversation or completely change the direction of a conversation. So if you're giving your physicians actual numbers instead of just a yes or no answer, you'll get a lot further with your practice. So what are some key performance indicators that we should look at? Um, well, MGMA is, is uh, many of you may be familiar with, medical group management association and um, many physicians and many health systems will actually use MGMA numbers when they're negotiating physician contracts or when they're, they are measuring physician performance or uh, management performance. They'll use MGMA. And MGMA um, will produce a survey every year. And some of the key performance indicators that better practices measure is the percent of AR over 120 days. I go into practices and I will look at a practice and um, ask for their accounts receivable report. And one of the first things I look at is their AR over 120% and what is that distribution. Well, it's going up. The AR over 120 days is unfortunately going up with um, 
the high deductible health plans and uh, patients becoming more responsible for a larger portion of their of their um, of their health care cost. And but better performing practices have somewhere around 10 or 11 percent of AR over 120 days, no more than that. So when you look at your AR, you want to look at uh, the first thing to look at, you'll look at all of it, but the first thing to look at is the AR over 120 days to see what percentage that is. Days gross fee-for-service charges charges are in AR. Um, sometimes I will see these at, um, you know, 20 days. Um, and if you're seeing a really, really low number there, you want to be careful that your practice is not writing things off too quickly, but typically days in AR, a good number for days in AR are uh, 29, somewhere around 29 or 30 days. Um, let's look at a um, number of claims submitted electronically. You want to be sure you're submitting all of your claims electronically, even your secondary claims. I'll go into a practice where they're submitting most of their primary claims electronically, but with the clearinghouses today, you can submit almost all of your secondary claims electronically um, instead of printing those to paper and sending those with, we used to have to print them to paper and copy the primary EOB, but now um, those can be submitted electronically through your clearinghouses. Number of claims denied on first submission. Um, we know that when we have to refile a claim, there's a cost to that, and the average is somewhere around $12 to $15 that it costs us to refile a claim. So when you're not getting sending clean claims, then you're costing your practice a lot of money. So measuring the claims denied on first submission um, is something, a key performance indicator that you should look at, and your your clearinghouse can typically give you this information pretty easily without you having to do a lot of manual work. And then you want to compare your practice uh, to these key performance indicators. And we'll talk further about some of those. When I do an analysis for a practice, this is actually a, a uh, an AR benchmark report, dashboard report that I uh, actually went in and evaluated a practice and looked at their um, days in AR, I'm sorry, looked at their AR distribution, which uh, immediately I looked at their AR over 120 days, which was very, very good compared to the MGMA numbers. One of the things we look at, and I caution practices to be careful of, is credit balances. Um, you want to look at your credit balances to be sure you're in compliance with Medicare's uh, refund rules and with your other commercial insurance carriers' refund rules. You do not want large credit balances out, out in your accounts receivable. And another reason is because those credit balances will make your AR look lower than, than it really is. So as a manager, if you've got a business office um, manager who's giving you an accounts receivable report, you want to be sure that AR report is net of credit balances. Otherwise, it could make your AR look, look lower than it really is. Have them run a separate credit balance report. And I have practices whose systems won't run a credit balance report, so I tell them go in and run an AR report, an accounts receivable report, for balances less than zero, and that should give you what your credit balances are. Of course, we look at days in AR um, to be sure that they are where they should be. And in this situation, this particular report, I, I had a concern because their AR looked really good. Um, if I look at their AR distribution over 120 days, but their days in AR was high. So, so I don't want to just look at, at my AR distribution, and I don't want to just look at my days in AR. I need those two numbers combined to see if, if, um, 
or at least get an indication that my practice is doing well collecting money. In this case, those two were uh, contrasting and conflicting, so we had to do further research to, to determine what was going on. And there were some, some, a lot of write-offs that had been done of old balances. But my days in AR combined with my AR distribution should give me a good picture of my, uh, how my collections process is working. Now, gross collection is something we have to be very careful about because gross collection is a product of um, what I'm charging. And we all know that we can't go out to other practices and say, what are you charging? We need to be able to compare our gross collection rate to your gross collection rate. And so let's all charge the same thing. We would all go to jail, and that wouldn't be any fun. So, um, and I used to have to caution my physicians. I had a physician that would go out and say, well, I just talked to the doctor in the doctor's lounge, another physician, and they're collecting, you know, 70% of their bill charges. And why can't we, why aren't we doing that? I must not be collecting enough. And I would explain over and over again that, that gross collections is what he was talking about, and gross collections is a product of what we charge, and we're probably probably not charging what the practice uh, next door is charging. So be very careful with that. But this is just a, a little dashboard uh, report on accounts receivable. Okay, um, guys, can we um, put up the first polling question? Uh, the first polling question is, does your organization currently measure days in AR? Do you all see that? Do you see it, uh, Jackie, Brad? Um, I'm not seeing it One on my screen. Here. How about there? There we go. <clears throat> and just a reminder to those that are looking at this here, uh, we need at least uh, two-thirds of the polling questions answered for your credit today as you answer this. Guys, I have the paint poll open. Are you seeing those que that question get answered? Uh, Brad? Yeah, um, so we'll leave Tell this you, open. Yeah, it's almost done. Yep, we'll leave okay, this open great. for a couple more seconds, but, uh, yep, okay. overwhelming majority, 73% um, replied yes, 22% uh, this didn't apply to them, and only 5% said no. Okay, okay, great, great. Well, we all know that... Um, that uh, the percentage of AR uh, over 120 days, um, uh, we want that to be very low because that shows the amount that we're owed from patients and insurance. And I encourage practices and um, anyone measuring accounts receivable um, to separate that by patient and to separate it by insurance um, because it's very important to know um, if your insurance AR is getting over 120 days, you may be hitting some timely file, filing limit to where you're not going to be able to collect those even if, if they're a clean claim if you filed them too late. And I work with practices all the time who've had some glitch in their in their clearinghouse or in their filing, and they didn't know some huge batch didn't get to Medicare or didn't get to Blue Cross, and um, so there's they hit a timely filing limit, at least with the commercial plans that's typically 90 days, and they're not going to be able to collect those balances. So you want to want to look at that. Uh, I encourage you to look at that by patient and by insurance. And um, again, um, be, if you're asking for an accounts receivable report from your staff, be sure that it's net of credit balances or you may not be getting the entire picture. 
typically, again, the, um, the ARs somewhere between 12 to 18 percent, somewhere around 10 percent um, for best practices. Uh, if your AR over 120 over 120 days is greater than 25 percent, that's a red flag, and you should do some digging as to and, and asking a lot of questions as to why that AR is over 100 uh, over 25 percent because there's some old AR out there that may just need to be written off that's not collectible at all due to timely filing or other other reasons. Um, we know that days in AR some, um, is the number of days that it takes you to collect an average day's worth of charges. So, for example, if your average charge, if, if your practice charges on average $5,000 a day, then how long does it take you to collect that $5,000? Now, again, practices should be careful because if you've added a new physician, or two new physicians, a lot of practices are growing, and if you're hiring new physicians, then you need to be careful with this number and understand how that affects your accounts receivable. New physicians are going to start out um, with charges, but not a lot of collections. So you may want to measure that physician's AR, um, look at it as a whole, but then separate that physician's AR uh, from your total accounts receivable because it's going to make your accounts receivable look a little off and not as good as you want it to. Uh, uh, on the same token, if you've had um, several physicians out and don't have quite as many charges, um, that you've had five physicians out in June for vacation, then it may make your AR look, um, it may not be a true picture of your accounts receivable. So you want to understand those um, nuances when you're looking at AR. Um, of course, days in, days in AR, the days in AR calculation is total accounts receivable. Again, um, insurance and patient balances, less your credit balances, and collection agency accounts. And this is important. When you benchmark, most of the benchmarks out there, um, MGMA and other benchmarks, when practices turn balances over to collection agencies, they will write those accounts off their accounts receivable. And if you're not writing those accounts off of your accounts receivable, at least move them to an area where they do not print on your accounts receivable report because when you're benchmarking, that's going to make your, if you have collection agency accounts in there, it's going to make your your days in AR really, really ugly. <laughs> um, uh, so that's your total AR um, divided by um, 12 months of gross charges, or it can be six months of gross charges. And if it's six months, your denominator would be 180 days instead of 365. It would be the number, the number of months um, uh, of charges divided by the number of the days in those months. Okay, your days in AR, uh, also many people call it days receivables outstanding. Uh, days in AR would be um, an average of 35 to 45 days, and it's a red flag if it's over 50. Actually, if now if you're getting up in the 45-day range, I, I get concerned when I see days in AR are really over in the 40 to 45 uh, range, but definitely if you've got AR, if your days in AR is over 50, then you should be very, very concerned. And that's something you should benchmark every month. Um, you should be looking at your days in AR. Um, another benchmark to look at for um, accounts receivable is um, net collection rate. And net collection rate is revenue that's collectible divided by the net charges. This is one of the best um, best benchmarks out there, but it's really and truly the hardest to get to a true net collection rate. Um, again, it's revenue that's collectible divided by net charges. And an example is if um, 
your physician bills Blue Cross $120 and your allowed amount is $100, then you're going to write 20 off as a collect, uh, contractual write-off. So your allowed amount, the amount that, that the most you can get is $100 of that $120 charge. If you collect 98% of that $100, then you have a net collection rate of 98%. Uh, now, I'll have, have uh, organizations that will say their net collection is 102%. Well, they're not, they're not uh, actually measuring um, a true net collection. Net collections is, should never be over 100%. And, and um, a good net collection rate is somewhere around 95, 96, 97%. If it's below 90%, then, then that means you've got um, about a 10% bad debt rate. So so that percentage that we're not collecting should just be bad debt. It's not our contractuals. Um, and one of the reasons this number is really hard to get to is that um, physicians will say, oh, this is my buddy. Um, I'm going to do surgery for his wife and just write that off. And if you write that off as bad debt, then you're not giving yourself credit. That that should really not factor into your net collection rate. Net collection rate should be something you have control over, um, and sh that that percent you don't collect should really just be bad debt. Okay. We're going to look at gross collections again. Gross collections gets physicians in trouble, and sometimes gets managers in trouble when it shouldn't, but. Gross collections is total collections over gross charges, and again, gross charges, um, if we could all charge the same, we would uh, uh, be in good shape in, in using this as a benchmark, but it's something we still want to measure because we talked about internal benchmarks and external benchmarks. Gross collections is a really good internal benchmark. So last year, um, I, my gross collection rate was 57%, and it's dropped to 50%. And I didn't increase my charges, and I didn't have any payer contracts change on me. So why I need to explain the difference in why my collections have dropped. So, the, so gross collections is a great external benchmark. Now, I have physicians a lot of times who will compare um, their gross collections to their uh, partner's gross collections. And um, that's a fair, fair question to ask, and you need to be able to understand why you have physicians internally who may be collecting different, uh, have a different gross collection rate. And there's good explanations, you just need to be able to explain that. So we look at um, cash collected in 2014 of 100,000, gross charges of 180,000, and our gross collection rate was 55%. Is that good or is that bad? Well, in gross collections, we just want to know. We want to know what it is, and we want to use it as an internal benchmark. Now, if I'm looking at it, if I'm looking at a practice and their uh, gross collection rate is, say, 70% or greater, then it makes me wonder about their fee schedule. Is their fee schedule too high? And then that could be it. Their fee schedule could be, you know, if they're charging a thousand percent of Medicare on every procedure, their their fee schedule could be too high. If it's below forty percent, then is it? Um, I'm sorry, is, is their fee schedule too low if it's above seventy percent? And then if it's if it's below forty percent, is their fee schedule too high? So it it um, there's not a right or wrong answer unless you're not collecting enough or you're collecting uh, too much and it could mean that your fee schedule is too low. So now we move to physician productivity, um, which we get calls all the time at. I work for SVMIC, the Medical Practice Services Department, and we 
insure about 15,000 physicians, and so we can get calls from any any of those 15,000 physicians. And often the call that we get will say, I'm working harder and I'm making less money. You've got to come in and tell me what's wrong. And they want to look at, at uh, expenses. They want to look at, uh, you know, the st- too many staff. And oftentimes the reason that that they're not making the money they want to make is physician productivity. So we'll go in and we'll look at um, different different measures of productivity, which may be patient encounters, uh, the number of encounters and the types of encounters, whether they're new patients, existing patients, whether it's surgeries or deliveries. Um, one of the best measures of productivity that equalizes everything is work RVUs. And if, you, if you're not familiar with work RVUs, um, you want to familiarize yourself with, with um, that term and how they're calculated and what work RVUs mean. But many hospital systems and health systems who employ physicians or who even have a professional services agreement with physicians are paying physicians based on work RVUs. And they'll look at MGMA's, you know, uh, median work RVU to determine whether the physician is will get a bonus, whether the physician, what the work RVU, the payment per work RVU that they're going to pay that physician. So work RVU is definitely a measure of productivity and a, and a good measure. Um, we look at charges and collections um, because, again, that's a good internal benchmark and it's one way to compare your physician partners with each other. Uh, we look at adjustments and level of service statistics is something you also want to look at. Um, your EM coding, if physicians are, we have a lot of um, physicians who are, are um, elderly or getting ready to retire or who are just kind of old school and don't want to they're a little nervous about coding a level four office visit, and so they code everything as a level two office visit, a nine nine two one two, and um, then they want to know why they're collecting less money. They think they see as many patients as their partner. You know, the new uh, the new physician that we hired a year ago. I'm seeing as many patients as he or she is, and I'm just not collecting the money. Well, this level of service, they may be seeing as many patients, but their coding levels may be below what an average physician would code, and so you want to measure that. And also look at payer mix. We talked earlier about physicians comparing their gross collection rate to each other, and payer mix may be one reason that that gross collection rate is different than another physician. one physician may be seeing a lot more commercial patients, and another physician may be seeing more Medicare and Medicaid patients. So that will certainly affect collections. So when I look at a practice, um, one of the things I do is I look at their encounters. I look at office visits and hospital visits, and this is an actual comparison of a three-physician practice that I worked with. And you can see that there are uh, the MGMA median for office visits was 2,949, and we had two physicians well above um, the median and one physician well below the median. Now, there could be uh, reasons why that physician was below. We might be new. We might be seeing a lot of new patients because, remember, you want to look at the type of new patients, um, but you want to be able to explain why those office visits are different. And then look at hospital visits, are the physicians seeing their own patients in the hospital, and uh, compare total visits to know where physicians fall as far as their productivity is concerned. Uh, Again, this answers the question, um, is the physician as busy as he should be or wants to be? One of the things we look at is um, Although charges don't tell us everything, I like to look at charges just as a, just as a, a, a comparison. And um, 
not only do we use the MGMA benchmark, we use another benchmark called Professional uh, Support Resources. And um, again, you may use other benchmarks like medical e economics, but I like to compare the benchmarks to be sure one benchmark is a way, way, way different than another benchmark. So you can tell here the MGMA median and the PSR, which they don't do an average or a median, they will do a range. So the MGMA meeting median is well within the range for the charges benchmark and the receipts benchmark. So I will compare all my physicians, all, all the physicians that I'm working with, um, in, in this case it was five physicians, I look at their charges and I look at their payments to see if, if they're in line or not in line. And you can tell um, most of the physicians are right at the MGMA median with one physician being below the median. Um, and you want to, again, these numbers will say everything to the physicians. And most of the practices that I go into have honestly never looked at their practice this way. They've never looked at their practice, you know, compared to their peers. Um, you know, it, many practices are not as transparent as they should be. When I went in to manage a practice, they were, the physicians were afraid to compare, to show each other uh, the numbers. They, they didn't want one physician to see another physician's numbers. And I said, this is crazy. So I started um, showing all the physicians, all the physicians' numbers. And it changed behavior. Uh, on many of the physicians, and and you would have physicians come into meetings explaining that they were on vacation, or they had a sick child, or they had had surgery, or explaining, really trying to explain why their why their productivity was not at the level of past productivity, or not at the level of another physician they worked with. Now we mentioned uh, payer mix. Payer mix um, is definitely a factor of collect of uh, collections, it can affect your collections, and you want to monitor your payer mix, not only for, uh, you know, why one physician may be collecting different than another, or uh, you want to know, are we, is our 10 care percentage growing? Um, do we um, have, you know, all the commercial business we want? Are we seeing too much uh, government insurance? You know, what is, where's our self-pay? How are we doing with self-pay? So you want to understand uh, your payer mix. And when you go into negotiations with payers, it's really important to know this and to know more about your practice than the payer knows. And you will be would be surprised how many practices do not understand their payer mix. And one way we get to payer mix is we look at charges uh, by payer, that kind of equalizes everything. So we look at, at uh, you know, what charges we had for each payer. And sometimes you, you may want to look at payments by payer to look at payer mix for some reason, but most of the time it's uh, you look at charges. Now we talked about um, coding levels, E&M coding levels. And when I look at a practice, I collect their, their um, their CPT codes, and uh, we purchase a um, we purchase the standards or the coding uh, standards for practices of different specialties, and we benchmark the physicians against those national coding standards. And believe me, if you don't think the payers are doing this, then you're wrong. The payers are looking at you and benchmarking you as well. So if you're not benchmarking yourself, then you're missing out on an opportunity. And payers know when I worked for Blue Cross for seven years and I knew uh, when I knew more about the, the practice than the, than the physician or the manager knew about themselves. And you don't want to be the underdog in that situation. So um, you want to know these things. You want to know how you compare to national standards. And you can tell here that this physician had 434 new patient visits in a 12-month period, and that uh, this physician was using the practice as the blue line, and this physician was using more 99202s than they were 205. And on uh, existing patients, the 99211 through 99215, 
this practice was pretty much right on this physician was and you don't see that very often but but you you do see that sometimes and then you can also measure the difference if um, on new patients if I coded at the level of the national standards then how much additional revenue would my practice bring in for this physician um, this is inpatient and subsequent visits um, that's something you can measure. Um, again, uh, looking at this particular physician, and you want to be careful and you want to know what your number is. You want to know how many visits. So we had 74 inpatient uh, visits, admission, and then subsequent visits, 285. Again, you want to know the difference in the gaps there. And in this particular case, my physician is coding higher levels than the national standards. So again, it's not to tell the physician you need to code lower or you're coding too high. It's to tell the physician be sure that there is medical necessity and be sure that you're documenting for the level you're coding. Okay? Hospital discharge, uh, again, we look at all of those things. Hey, Jackie, so that it's Brad. brings us to our revenue and expense benchmarks. When, yeah. Excuse me, Jackie. Brad, did you yeah. say something? Oh, yeah. I was just going to see. We hadn't done a polling question in a little while, and oh, I was going to yes, see if it was yes. time for we, another polling question. Let's do the question. next two polling questions, guys. Next two? Yes, the productivity Alrighty. polling questions. All right. There's the because we, I got excited and skipped past those. Uh, does your organization currently benchmark physician and provider productivity? That's 48, getting close to participation here. Uh -huh. Folks, and don't forget to, to even just respond NA if you uh, need your CPE certificate. This is part of the requirements from, from NASBA, our oversight organization. Okay, so far we've got 35% yes, 15 said no, and 50% said they don't apply. Uh, you want to go to the next one, Jackie? Sure, sure. Okay. We'll close that one. If you're currently benchmarking productivity, which measures are you benchmarking? Are you looking at patient encounters, RVUs, charges, collections, or level of service statistics on e &M coding? I think they're thinking about this one a little bit more, Jackie. Yeah, this, this is a tough one. We'll give them just a few more seconds here. Okay. Only got about 73% uh, participation thus far. So what we're seeing thus far is 14% patient encounters, 27% relative value units, 23% charges. 29% collections and 9% in the level of service. Okay. Okay. Okay, so great, great. You want to move on? So most, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. So most, pe most people are looking at RVU's charges and collections. Um, and so some opportunities would be to look at, also look at patient encounters 
and level of service statistics. So we'll look, um, now take a look at um, revenue and expense benchmarks. And um, uh, one of the things that when I go into a practice, I'll take their income statement and rearrange it to benchmark it as a percent of medical revenue. Um, so we'll take, take their income or their actual collections um, and um, we will look at, at their staff costs since it's one of the largest costs and we will benchmark that as a percent of what they're, they've collected because we know busier practices um, will, you know, sometimes have to have more staff. So if you looked at simply staff, uh, staffing ratios per physician for a really busy practice, it might look like they have too many staff. So you really want to look at that number along with uh, uh, staffing as a percent of medical revenue. And in, in this case, if I look at this practice, they were under MGMA benchmarks. Another number we look at is we look at uh, rent, rent or utilities or facility costs as a percent of medical revenue, because that's another, um, another area that's a large expense in our practice. And just a thought there, a lot of times when I compare uh, practices who own their own buildings, when I look at their benchmarks as a percent of medical revenue, uh, because typically they'll have another corporation handle the real estate part of the practice, and sometimes that will be a little higher. So if I see, you know, nine or ten percent um, uh, facility costs as a percent of medical revenue, my first question is, do you own your own building? <laughs> uh, then in this practice, it was a pediatric practice. We pulled the immunizations out and benchmarked those, and then look at other expenses. And then what we're left with is income for distribution. So we take all the direct physician costs out, like I've even seen, honest to goodness, the truth, I've seen airplanes in a p &L statement and cars. And so we take all of those things out that physicians might put in their, um, in their uh, profit loss statement for tax purposes and uh, compare those so that we're comparing apples to apples with other benchmarks and certainly MGMA benchmarks to, to, to say of what you're bringing in, uh, uh, physician, what percent are you taking home? And um, you don't want a physician who's who's collecting but spending every every almost every dime they make going out in expenses. Um, to where their income for distribution uh, that goes to the physicians is, you know, 10% or 20%. Although we're seeing that decrease some, we want them to still, you know, have, have um, you know, 30 or more percent less to take home. So comparing, uh, comparing those, the collections, or the expenses as a percent of collections, as a percent of medical revenue, is a good way to benchmark. And again, all these benchmarks work together. You look at staffing as a uh, per physician, along with your staff costs as a percent of medical revenue to tell the whole story. In this in this particular situation, we pulled all the, these expenses out of their PNL and called these physician expenses. These expenses were not in there. Um, uh, in that number that we were comparing uh, as a percent of medical revenue. And then they wanted, in this case, they wanted to know, we have a dispensary, is our dispensary profitable? So we looked at that. We looked at their income for the dispensary, the expenses for the dispensary. It showed a loss, but what we knew is that we had just placed a large pharmaceutical order. So we knew they had just placed a large order for uh, the drugs, so we knew that this number, even though it said it was a negative number, the practice felt like they were in good shape and that's something we were going to keep an eye on. So another way to benchmark is to benchmark the practice against its 
itself. So to look at our expenses this year compared to our expenses last year, and look at our expenses uh, this month compared to uh, the current month from the last prior year. And so if I know that I spent um, uh, a certain amount on supplies this year, if I look at last year and the amount was triple, I want to know why. Why I spent triple the amount of medical supplies this year than I did last year? Or why is this month so different from last month? So that's a report that I produced for my physicians every single month. We looked at that and we looked at where there were variances and I had to explain those variances to my physician uh, to, and to our finance committee. So, so that's something you want to look at. And then a simple dashboard report should really only be one page. Um, can Guys, can we put up the last polling question? Uh, does your organization currently produce a dashboard report? Hey, Sandy, I've got one more question on here as well. Uh, if you currently produce a dashboard report, how many pages does it, uh, ha is it? You want to go ahead and throw that one up there? Sure. Okay. Uh, if, your current pro current, if you currently produce a dashboard report, how many pages is it? One, two, three? Uh, more than three or it just doesn't apply? And it looks like right now that 24% uh, have a one-pager, 4% have two, 8% have three, 18% have more than three, and about 47% say it doesn't apply. Okay, okay. Well, our – the school of thought and, and my thought is ideally your dashboard should really be one page. Um, that's kind of the definition of a dashboard. Certainly there are instances or things your practice may be looking at that warrant more than one page. Uh, but for a true dashboard report, it should really be have minimal important information on it. And we liken that to your physicians are used to looking at lab reports that are one or two pages. And so this is the lab report for their practice. And so if you teach them how to look at that, they can look at it and get an idea of where the practice stands, what's the current state of your practice. And so um, ideally a dashboard report should be one, maybe two pages. If you're producing a lot more, then your physicians may not be looking at those reports or may not be understanding those reports. I've seen practices to managers who say, well, I give my physicians those reports. Well, the physicians tell me they're not looking at those reports because it's too much information. So ideally, you're going to have a standard concise report, and your dashboard report may not look just like what you're seeing on the screen, but it should be readable, minimal, understandable. And in this particular report, I like that, that this practice was recording the days the physicians were in the office because 
you can tell a big variance there. Uh, um, you've got one physician who might have been out on vacation or one physician who might be um, typically only average 11 days in the office. And when I worked in a practice, I, this is something I measured. I measured the days in the office. And I would give them a report every month that told him, told them the days they were in the office along with the days the other physicians were in the office. Now, what reports do you need to create these reports, uh, create dashboards, create benchmarking? All of these benchmarks that I've shown you were created just from this list of basic reports. So these are reports that your practice should be producing, and many of them can just be produced in a summary format. But these are basic reports that every system should produce um, and every practice should produce. And if you're not getting these reports, you should be able to go back and ask for these reports from your vendors, from your managers. Um, and they're just reports that you absolutely should be able to get. Now, many systems will now, many new and updated systems will create dashboard reports or allow you to customize dashboard reports, but, but um, you should absolutely be giving your physician some sort of summary of your practice. So finally, um, transparency in a medical practice should be expected. It's, physicians' numbers shouldn't be hidden from other physicians' numbers. That, Transparency is something that every practice should have, should expect when you're hiring new positions, you should expect that transparency. Um, you should understand your financial reports and your financial status, and ideally your personal account, it should be different than the practice's accountant. So the individual physician should have different accountants than the practices. Um, and just because, um, you can report on something doesn't mean you should report it. Again, that goes back to that stack and stack of, of reports that you give your physicians. Um, just because you can report it doesn't mean you should report on it. So any questions at this point? So we don't have any questions in the question box. So if anybody's got a, a question, please go ahead and submit it through the, uh, the, uh, the questions area there and the, uh, go to webinar controls. Um, Jackie, I'll chime in. At one point in my career, I worked uh, heavily with the uh, physician practice here at Vanderbilt. And I know one of the things we used to do was was the old graph packages. Um, and they could flip through that 10 or 15 pages in about two minutes. And, and they had a, a whole bunch of questions for us every month. So that was another That's way kind great. of before the dashboards. Physicians love that. They love pictures. They love graphs. They love ranges so that's that's a great way to report to your physician so the the uh the, the only question i got was just someone asking about the slides and so just a reminder um you can get the slides from our website uh the link is down in the chat area um, or you can always just go to tnhfma dot org forward slash webinars um, and, and access all of our webinars there. Well, thank you all very much. I, I enjoyed uh, presenting to you today. And if, if I can be of assistance to any of you, please, uh, you have my office phone number, my cell phone, and my email address. Jackie, thank you so much for your time today. Goodness, some great information you covered there. We really do appreciate it. I'm sure everybody else feels the same way. Also, folks, remember that your CP certificates will be sent to you via email uh, around the end of the month, and the recording of this will be on YouTube as well. Uh, that's it for our recording today. Brad, do you have anything to add? Uh, don't, guys. You did a great job. Thank you to you, and thank you to Jackie. All right. Everybody have a great day. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.